Now let us read together Psalm 22. We read the whole of the 22nd Psalm. Psalm 22, dedicated to the chief musician upon Ijaleth Shahar, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and I am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of people, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced me my hands and my feet. I may tell or number all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Amen.
Let's read together Lord's Day 14. Lord's Day 14. It's found on page 97 of the Green Creeds book. Lord's Day 14. An admirable summary of Scripture's teaching in this regard. What is the meaning of these words? He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. That God's Son, who is and continueth true and eternal God, took upon him the very nature of man, of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, by the operation of the Holy Ghost, that he might also be the true seed of David, like unto his brethren in all things, sin excepted. What profit dost thou receive by Christ's holy conception and nativity, that he is our mediator, and with his innocence and perfect holiness covers in the sight of God my sins, wherein I was conceived and brought forth. Lord's Day 14, beloved, comes immediately after two Lord's Days that treat our Saviour's names. Jesus, Christ, only begotten Son of God, and Lord, the one we looked at last time. Lord's Day 14 also begins what we may call the descending stages in our Saviour's state of humiliation. There is his lowly birth, and then it goes downhill to his substitutionary sufferings, to his atoning death, and to his burial. And this evening, as we look at Lord's Day 14, we're going to consider the various components Involved in the Christian confession, he was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. Words from the Apostles' Creed, as you realize. Words that are explained, first of all, in question and answer 35 of our Catechism. And the emphasis on the explanation of them will be upon simplicity and clarity, breaking down the various components so we all see what's involved in this classic Christian confession. Then we're going to consider together the significance of this for us and for our salvation. And there especially we'll be thinking of the second question and answer in Lord's Day 14, namely question and answer 36. Let's look then at Christ's holy conception and nativity, which you may realize those words are taken from question 36. Christ's holy conception and nativity. First, the great doctrines that are involved in it. And then the practical lessons which we draw from it. The great doctrines and the practical lessons of Christ's holy conception and nativity. The first doctrine that is essential for truly grasping our Lord's conception is that of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity, as our, even our children should know, includes the truth that God is one in being. There are not three gods. God is one. There is one divine and spiritual essence. So that he is infinite truth and mercy, holiness, life and love. That he is unchangeably powerful and righteous and wise. The one divine essence. Along with that, and equally ultimate, is the truth that God is three in persons. One in being. So he's one in that sense, and three in persons, he's three in a different sense. Those three persons being, as we know most clearly from our baptism formula, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So at each of the three persons, 
possess all of the divine fullness, and there is neither greater nor lesser within the three. And since each of the three persons possess all of the divine essence, I hope you can follow this point, this means that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit perfectly indwell each other. I'll say it again. If the Father possesses all the divine essence, and the Son possesses all the divine being, and the Spirit possesses all of the deity, then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indwell each other perfectly. And this is the greatest intimacy and knowledge and love, the deepest possible union and communion, which is the basis for all that the Scripture teaches about the covenant of grace that God establishes with us in Jesus Christ. The Spirit indwells us because He indwells the Godhead. Now we move from the beautiful truth of the Trinity, essential for understanding the incarnation of Jesus, to the person of the Son. As the Son of God, and as that name essentially requires, He is eternally begotten of the Father. The Son can only be Son because he was generated by the first person of the Trinity. If you are a son, you have, or at the very least, you had a father. A son is impossible without a father. So too in God. Jesus is the son because, first of all, with respect to his divine nature, the father eternally generated the son. And so this Son is eternally and unchangeably and fully divine. He possesses all the riches of the Godhead and he dwells deep in the bosom of the Father. Because this isn't a troubled home, so to speak. There's no estrangement. The Son is in the bosom of the Father. John 1.18 states that. <coughs> Now, having considered the Son's divine nature, we now turn to his human nature. Jesus was and is a true human being. He isn't a specter or some sort of a ghost. He didn't merely appear to be a man. It wasn't that the apostles merely thought that they saw and heard him and touched him and handled him, they really did. They were not deceived. A true human nature, as truly was and is he human, as you today are human. That's interesting too, with the craziness of our world that has lost God. Ultimately, <coughs> ultimately, rooted in it all, is the hatred of Jesus Christ, the true human being. When you get a person so darkened with lies that they actually think and they want to register themselves as a cat or a dog or something else. And there are people like that and there will be more in the days ahead as this is encouraged and promoted. Jesus, a true human being. His human nature was complete. We must not think that our Savior had a human body, but that his deity sort of took the place of his soul or spirit. So he's only sort of half a man. That's not it. Jesus is body and soul just as much as you are body and soul, or spirit, or mind, or heart. This true and complete human nature, like us, that Jesus possessed is weakened. And that's a very useful term. That explains so much. 
Jesus is the last Adam. And he took a human nature like the first Adam. But he didn't take what we might call a strong human nature. Like Adam before the fall. Like Adam in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And not like Adam in Genesis 3. Our Lord Jesus took a weakened human nature, akin to Adam's human nature, post-sin, post-fall, after the events of Genesis 3. So Jesus Christ, as a man, was susceptible to tiredness and pain, and was tired and suffered pain, even descending into hell in his agonies on the cross, and he was made liable to death. Adam before the fall was not mortal. He could not die in that condition. But Jesus Christ took a weakened human nature, one which was able to die. And he did this because he cared and loved us, willing to suffer in our place. You understand too, beloved, that Jesus' human nature was and is sinless. And here, and at this point, his human nature is like that of Adam before the fall, not after the fall. This is unlike the comparison with Adam's human nature with regard to Christ's weakened humanity. So that Jesus Christ, unlike Adam, and even unlike Adam before the fall, is not only sinless, but also impeccable. That is, not only did he not sin, but he could not sin. <coughs> Let's go further. We have looked so far, especially at three key components that underlie the incarnation. The Holy Trinity. The incarnation doesn't ultimately make sense without that doctrine. Then we focused upon the second person, of the Holy Trinity, the Son, before we turn thirdly to his human nature. And with these things in mind, we're now in a position to consider the incarnation itself. Incarnation. And the carn bit, it means flesh, the enfleshment of the Son. That's what the word itself means breaking it down into its components, the enfleshment of the Son. But as we've seen, it's not only that he takes human flesh, understood as body, it's he took human flesh of a whole human being, truly, fully man, with a weakened, though sinless, human nature. The Son of Man took that human nature to himself, he assumed it, brought it into personal union. That's what the Son did, brought that human nature into personal union with himself. <coughs> it's worth pointing out here that the human nature of Jesus Christ never existed outside of that union with the eternal Son. There wasn't so much as a millisecond when Christ's human nature was not joined to the second person. It had no separate existence even for a moment. Right from the formation of the human nature of Jesus Christ, that human nature was in personal union with the divine Son. The divine Son assumed, took to himself, that human nature right at its very beginning the divine son eternally is and lives and he assumed at a certain point in time a human nature it's worth pointing out here too the rules of various parties in the incarnation what about the role of man meaning here by man a male <coughs> namely joseph or for that matter, any other man. No role whatsoever. Joseph did not generate the human nature of Jesus Christ, 
as our earthly fathers generated us because Mary was a virgin. There was a role of the Holy Spirit, you could even say in one sense, though I admit it's a bit crude, the Holy Spirit's role didn't just take the place of the man, but did that and a whole lot more, without any sexual activity, of course, being attributed to the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit who miraculously wrought Mary's conception, which of course fits with the nature of the Spirit's role in all the works of God outside himself. Everything that God does in this world is of the Father as the source, by the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. So that the Spirit is the one who perfects and completes the divine works. Though all the works of God are indivisible, with a particular role or function of each of the three persons in those works of God outside himself. And the Spirit perfects and completes, especially here in the way of sanctifying or consecrating or setting apart this human nature from sin and for Jesus. He sets apart this human nature particularly for the Son of God. He perfectly fits this human nature for the work of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit sees to it that it is, this human nature is sinless. He's the Holy Spirit. There's no role of man. And there's a special role of the Holy Spirit in forming and perfecting this human nature for Jesus. There's also a role for Mary. The Catechism says that Mary provided Christ's, quote, flesh and blood. In the 21st century, we would probably say that Mary provided Christ's genetic makeup. The Lord being a true human being, it would have been possible, had the technology existed at that time, to have looked at his <coughs> genes. His genes would have been very similar in many regards to those of the Virgin Mary. He probably would have looked like her, maybe even more than most sons, because he was her biological son. He wasn't the biological son of Joseph, but he was the biological son of Mary. And Mary willed this. That's the point in Luke 1 verse 38. The angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary in Nazareth and explained that the son of David, the Messiah, would be born of her, even though she did not know a man. The Holy Spirit explained that this would be a mighty work of God because with God, all things are possible. And Mary, evidently understanding at least some of this, said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. That is, she will. She wanted. She agreed to even. The incarnation of the Son of God in her womb. And this wasn't the free will of the sinner here. That's how Rome takes it. Mary is the sinner. Mary uses her free will. Everybody has free will to receive Jesus if they wish. No, no, no. There's always a way to mangle scripture if you're totally depraved and darkened, isn't there? No, no. She willed the will of God because she was already a believer, being regenerated. And by God's grace, she was made willing in the day of God's power. And she was certainly made willing, very willing. And the day of the incarnation certainly was a day of God's power. <coughs> it's true to say too though that Mary did not actually do something in the incarnation. She willed it. Her will was sweetly bent so that she wished what God was going to do through her. But she didn't do anything. 
How could she work conception in her womb? It doesn't even make sense. Even with normal, unmiraculous conception, a woman cannot make herself conceive, nor can her husband. It's not a matter of the human will. There's a certain physical right activity, of course, but even that is deep and mysterious. Well, Mary willed to conceive, but that was it. She didn't actually do anything. And then, of course, there is the role of the Son in this wonder of the Incarnation. He, of course, willed to assume that human nature that the Holy Spirit conceived in the Virgin Mary and of the Virgin Mary. And he willed to assume that real, complete, weakened, sinless human nature at the very moment that the Spirit conceived. You can even think of those famous words in Psalm 40, words which are quoted and explained in Hebrews 10, especially at this point, Lo, I come to do thy will. And at the moment of the incarnation, the conception of Jesus Christ, if ever there was a moment when he said, Lo, I come, that was the moment when he, though infinitesimally small, came into the world to save sinners. Lo, I come to do thy will. He willed that coming, and he willed that coming in the womb of the Virgin Mary to do God's will. We need now to consider only one more component of our Lord's incarnation, what we may call its genealogical aspect. You've seen that our Lord descended according to his human nature from Mary of Nazareth. With regard to Mary's lineage, she was, of course, from Adam and Eve, like everyone else, from Noah, like us too. We're all from Noah. She was from Shem. I don't know if any of us have descended from Shem. Perhaps. We don't know. Well, unless you spend a lot of money and a lot of time, you can't even go back that many generations. She was from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. She was of the tribe of Judah. And most especially for our purposes now, she was a descendant of King David. And in this way and through the Lord's incarnation, that he was conceived and born of the Virgin Mary, that he is David's Lord as well as David's son. It's interesting too that Psalm 22, which we read earlier, this psalm which speaks of the Lord Jesus, I think as we read this, everyone realized and understood that. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Verse 1. We all know that that's one of the words that Jesus used on the cross. Verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Part of verse 16 says, They pierced my hands and my feet. We had occasion to look at that when we studied Zechariah 13, not that long ago. Well, we have also these words in verses 9 and 10, words read and sung earlier. Jesus says, Thou art he, that took me out of the womb, referring to his birth, not his conception, that was nine months before, but his birth. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts after his birth. Verse 10, I was cast upon thee from the womb. Jesus now is speaking about the days and weeks and months before his birth and after his conception. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And now notice with me the heading. This is a psalm of David. And it's entirely appropriate that David here writes about his son, 
his great, 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 whatever it is, grandson, David's son. It was also David's Lord and Savior, as Jesus explained on the Tuesday of Passion Week. And Jesus here, being born of Mary, who was a descendant of David, is in fulfillment of the divine promise that the Lord Jesus would descend from King David. Foundational to this is the word of Nathan in 2 Samuel 7 about your son. You will have a son who will sit upon your throne. Solomon in the first generation and typically the Lord Jesus Christ passage which the prophets went back to and quarried time and time again. Isaiah did so, chapter 7 and 9 and 55 for instance. Jeremiah did so, chapter 30. Ezekiel, chapter 37. Hosea, chapter 3. Psalm 89 and many, many others. It's clear from the prophets and the psalmists that the Messiah will be a descendant of David. He was a descendant of David through the Virgin Mary. Because God is faithful and fulfills all his promises. Now at this point, and especially in light of the article in the Belgic Confession that deals with this, we note and oppose the Anabaptist error taught by Menno Simons, the one who gave his name to the Mennonites. He viewed the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary not as Christ being a flesh and blood descendant and baby of Mary but that Mary was a sort of a sort of tube or pipe in which Jesus was placed but there was no flesh and blood connection she just stored the baby but the baby was not from her, of her flesh and blood, of her genetically. The problem, of course, with that is not only is that not what the Bible teaches, but it doesn't really make Jesus a flesh and blood descendant of not only Mary now, but David and Judah and Noah and Adam. So it denigrates God's promises, God's covenant promises for our salvation. Now I hope all of this is clear to you, beloved. I've looked at the various components. Our faith makes sense. It holds together scripturally. It holds together theologically. God is one in being and three in persons. Number one. Number two, the second person, the divine son. He is the person of Jesus, the divine person, and he, his is the divine nature. Then we looked at Christ's human nature, number three, which human nature was assumed by the eternal son. And we looked at the roles in this, no man, no male. Mary willed it. The Holy Spirit conceived the human nature and the Son assumed that human nature personally. And then we look, number six, at the genealogical aspects. This is question and answer 35. What is the meaning of these words? He was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary. Now you'll see all I've been doing is explaining the elements here in the answer. That God's eternal Son, who is and continueth true and eternal God, took upon him, or assumed, the very or true nature of man, of the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, by the operation of the Holy Spirit, that he might also be the true seed of David, like unto his brethren in all things, sin accepted. 
all of the six components are there. They're there at the very least by very strong implication. Let's turn now to the practical lessons. And the first is that in this marvelous way, the Lord Jesus Christ is fitted to be our Savior. What profit dost thou receive by Christ's holy conception and nativity? That he is our mediator. And this, in the light of the Heidelberg Catechism, is a sort of restatement of question and answer 18. Who then is that mediator? Who in one person, the person of the Son, is both very God, divine nature, and real righteous man, human nature, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The word mediator is used in answer 36 because a mediator is a sort of go-between. And Jesus is fitted to be, our, to be the go-between betwixt God in heaven and man on earth because he's the eternal son who relates to God as fully equal. And he's a human being like us who can relate to us and who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And as such, Jesus is fitted to be our mediator, to pray for us, and before that, heavenly intercession, to go to the cross as a human being, able to obey for us and suffer for us, and as one who is divine, so that he is able to bear up through that divine nature, to bear up under the infinite <coughs> wrath of God and so give <coughs> infinite worth to his obedience and sufferings for us and so bring deliverance from sin and everlasting righteousness to a vast company of the universal or Catholic Church. That first. This truth, too, of our Lord's holy conception and birth also points up the fact that he is the Wonderful One. It was the first name given to him in Isaiah 9, verse 6. Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then the wonder of Jesus Christ is everything about him. His cross, his salvation of his people, his very person. And whatever way you approach Jesus, whatever angle you look at him, he's always a marvel. Even the way he comes into the world, his very conception, he's always different, better, higher, and yet so much beyond us, and yet like us. He's both. And that only adds to greater wonder. And now here's the one who enters the world in a unique way. No one before him did it this way. No one after him will. By a wonder. He wrought wonders in his ministry. You can't have someone who lived the way he lived. And not enter the world by a wonder. <coughs> if someone enters the world the way Jesus did. You expect great things from him. And then he performed wonders on the cross, making atonement for our sins. Verse 10 of Psalm 22. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Oh, certainly the triune God was Christ God from the womb. Certainly he was cast upon God from the womb. Because he was even miraculously conceived by God the Spirit in that womb. And then... Here Jesus is speaking and he skips forward now from his time in the womb to the cross in the next verse. And presumably too, Jesus is saying these words about his time on his mother's breasts and about his time in the womb when he was on the cross, because he can think back to that. And he says, Lord, don't be far from me now. 
Trouble's near. <clears throat> Who's going to help me, Lord, but thou? And he speaks about those who surrounded him at the cross in terms of animals, powerful, violent, nasty animals, dogs, lions, bulls, strong bulls of Bashan, goring him, <coughs> gaping upon him. His strength is dried up like a pot shirt. They're bringing me into the dust of death. The wonder of his conception to the wonder of the cross. This same Jesus who entered the world by a wonder, exited the world by a wonder. He rose from the dead on the third day. He ascended into heaven, both at the very start and at the very end of his time on earth. And he continues working wonders right now, upholding and governing the universe and saving and preserving the church. Psalm 22 talks about that as well. You may have noticed, and I tried to bring that out when I read Psalm 22, of the change in tone and note between verses 1 through 21, where it's all humiliation, it's all suffering, it's all distress, to verses 22 and following, where Jesus is now in heaven, glorified. Verse 27, All the ends of the earth shall remember, remember their sins, remember the cross, turn unto the Lord. And the kindreds of the nations shall worship before me. Not, not everybody, it's not post-millennialism. It's talking about the Lord's seed, the elect, the Catholic Church. Not the Roman Catholic Church, but Christ's Catholic Church. For the kingdom is the Lord's, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of grace. He's the governor among the nations. And so the greatest wonder in terms of its impact and visibility and publicity, the second coming of Christ, it's drawing near. And then there's this too, the catechism heightens this truth in its presentation. Jesus' miraculous conception addresses and deals with our original sin. An original sin, you understand, is first of all that guilt, and secondly that pollution, which is ours, under the righteous judgment of God, because in Adam's sin we fell all. He's our representative. When he sinned, we sinned. And the judgment of God is that all the descendants of Adam, Christ accepted, are punished for their guilt in Adam by being born into the world polluted and depraved and fallen. And here was one who was born without original sin. Even Adam wasn't born without original sin because Adam wasn't born. He was created sinless. He wasn't even a baby. He was a man when he was first formed. Jesus was born without original sin. So here's one, conceived and born without original sin, so that his innocence covers our guilt and pollution. And here's the one who's born perfectly righteous, so that his righteousness is reckoned or imputed to our account. And this is especially what the Catechism deals with in question and answer 36. What profit? What profit dost thou receive by Christ's holy conception and nativity? That he is our mediator. We've looked at that. And this is part of his mediation too. With his innocence and perfect holiness, he covers in the sight of God my sins wherein I was conceived and brought forth. And this is part of of the truth of the Lord's nativity which is totally denied by the unbelieving world in whatever form its remembrance of the incarnation takes. Anyone who celebrates the nativity of Jesus Christ must grasp original sin. Original sin. That's what that holy birth of the Son of God and his holy conception before that 
is especially addressing <coughs> original sin. This too, Christ's birth without sin, has gospel implications for our children as well. If you think, for instance, of the children of believers that die in infancy, a poignant subject addressed, as you well know, in Canons 1, Article 17. This applies also to those children who who were lost physically in, in the womb or stillborn later. Since we are to judge of the will of God from his word, which testifies that the children of believers are holy, not by nature, but in virtue of the covenant of grace in which they, together with the parents, are comprehended, godly parents have no reason to doubt of the election and salvation of their children, whom it pleaseth God to call out of this life in their infancy. And if someone says, but our children, and you've just been saying it, our children, including those lost in infancy, are conceived in sin, that's certainly the case. But Jesus Christ was conceived without original sin and in perfect righteousness. There is the cure for the children of believers who die in their infancy. And he can apply this purity and this righteousness to them and bring them to glory. And if you say, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, certainly God regenerates the elect children of believers who die in infancy in the womb. And it doesn't say, except a man be born he cannot see the kingdom of God because there are some who've gone right into the kingdom of heaven without being born, those who died in the womb. It says, except the man be born again, born from above. Those who are born again, an infancy no more blocks the new birth than old age because the spirit blows wherever he wills. And if you say no sin enters heaven and no sinner enters heaven, yes, but forgiveness of sins and righteousness in Jesus Christ can come even to unborn infants and little <coughs> tiny children because Jesus has sanctified that period of the human life pre-birth and soon after birth by his own sinless conception and purity. This applies, too, to the elect children of believers who do not die in infancy, but who live maybe to their 80s or 90s, hale and hearty much of the way. Because if God can regenerate the elect children of believers who die in infancy, it's not that difficult for him either to regenerate the elect children of believers who do not die in infancy. Like Jacob who was regenerated in his mother's womb and was busy fighting for the covenant before he was born, wrestling against his reprobate brother Esau for the promise. Like Jeremiah, who was sanctified in the womb and set apart to be a prophet unto God to the nations. Like John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Like the little ones who cried Hosanna to the son of David in the temple. In Matthew 21, like the babes and sucklings who praised God. Babes and sucklings. They're at the milk drinking stage who praised God in Psalm 8 verse 2. One final word of application. This Lord's Day also opposes abortion. Namely, the killing of unwanted babies by selfish mothers or selfish fathers or both. And it opposes abortion because it teaches that the unborn child is a real human being. Think of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ himself did not become a person 
after he was born. He was a person in the womb. He did not become a person after six weeks or eight weeks or 18 weeks or 20 weeks or whatever in the womb. He was a person at the very point of conception. Psalm 22 verse 10, Jesus says, I was cast upon thee from the womb. I, according to my human nature, says Jesus, was cast upon thee from the womb. He was an I. He was a person in his mother's womb. And when it says, I was cast upon thee from the womb, it means right throughout his time in the womb. Not, I was cast upon thee from the womb after I was 20 weeks old. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. God was his God, and he was in a covenant fellowship with God even before he saw the daylight, before his birth. The Apostles' Creed also backs up this contention because it says, He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Not, it was conceived by the Holy Ghost and it became a he when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And Lord's Day 14, in its treatment of Christ's holy conception and birth, <coughs> treats him, speaks of him always <coughs> as a person while he was in his mother's womb. And all human beings too were persons, persons in the womb, persons at conception. And they have to be persons at conception, otherwise they couldn't be, as Psalm 20, 51 <coughs> says, conceived in sin. You can't be conceived in sin unless you're a person. God can't impute sin to a known person. Which means that abortion, obviously, is murder. Murder of the unborn, murder of the very weakest. In our world, with its Marxist ideology, is big at the victimization. And there are victims. But all this victimization thing only, only lessens the true victims. But what about the weakest? What about the least able? The unborn. They can be killed. They're dispensable in selfishness. This is true hatred of mankind. <coughs> hatred of a little one that stands in the way of someone's pleasures. And it's hatred ultimately of the great and glorious one who was conceived in the womb and was born of the Virgin Mary, that holy woman who did not want to kill her unborn son even though it brought stigma to her. Have you fornicated, but you're not even married? Maybe this child's going to ruin your life. She believed the word of God, and she didn't consider killing the Son of God in its infancy. That was the job of Herod, not the Virgin Mary. Our calling is to believe in this one, including believing in his holy conception and birth that led him to the cross, <coughs> and to love him who first loved us, and we showed it by his bitter and shameful death. Amen. Our Father in heaven, grant to us the Holy Spirit of this same Jesus, the Holy Spirit who conceived him in the womb, the Holy Spirit who equipped him and sustained him for his ministry. Sanctify us, Lord God, and set us apart to thy service and give us strength to serve and follow thee. For Jesus' sake. Amen.